Well, good morning. Happy Easter. Welcome to Walden Community Church. I know it's another confusing Easter, right? It <laughs> isn't, it seems like Easter is the most confusing holiday out of all of them. Because on the one hand, you've got Jesus and the resurrection. And then on the other hand, you have rabbits and eggs. <laughs> and you want to somehow mesh the two together and you want to explain it to your children and you just don't know how. And I, I suppose you could look it up, I suppose. Uh, but if you did, there's a, there's a lot of misinformation out there about the origins of Easter. So I want to help you. I want to help you. And then, you know, I'll help you. And then you, you can share it with your friends. Okay, so eggs. Where did eggs come from? Um, eggs came from the Hebrews. Really, yes. Uh, Easter falls during Lent. Easter falls during the Lenten season. During that time, the Hebrew people, the Jews, they are not allowed to eat meat or meat byproducts. And so what they would do is they would save eggs. They would save eggs to eat during Lent. And uh, the best way to save eggs is to hard boil them. And if they were going to have a feast the last day of Lent, then what they would do is they would turn the eggs into these little gifts by dyeing them and decorating them. Now, bunnies, bunnies are much more recent. We see bunnies first spring up in history around the 1500s. It's from Germany. Uh, people coming outside of church in the spring would see rabbits leaping in the tall grass. And they would say, look, those are the Easter rabbits, Easter hares, okay? And, uh, oh yeah, and we're the only really ones that call it Easter. The, in the United States, the States, we are the only ones that call it Easter. The entire rest of the world calls it Pascha. Pascha just comes from the Hebrew word again for Passover. So it's just the holiday that falls at Passover. And we have chocolate because um, it's a holiday. <laughs> it's a holiday. And I mean, can you think of a holiday that does not include chocolate? Every, every holiday includes chocolate. Americans love chocolate. We do. Uh, according to research, 81% of the U.S. likes to eat chocolate. 81%. So it's a lot of us, right? So of course, we're going to have chocolate on a holiday. 50% uh, of the, U the U.S. To eat chocolate every single day. Can you believe that? Half of America eats chocolate every single day. The average American consumes about nine and a half pounds of chocolate a year. So I think I've already, I think I've already hit that for the year uh, for me. And, and you know who likes, uh, which, which, which chocolate is, is more favored among Americans, milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Do you know? It's milk chocolate, yeah. Milk chocolate uh, wins. You probably already, already knew that. This is, this is a great way to start your sermon, by the way. You know, start, start your sermon talking about chocolate and, and you have immediate buy, you have immediate buy-in. <laughs> Everybody can relate. All right, moms, moms, moms out there. Let's see if you can relate to this. So as a kid, my mom was constantly buying me two things. She was buying me shoes and jeans. And it wasn't because I was growing out of them. I mean, look at me. Does it look like I grew much? I, I didn't grow much. Um, you know why? It's because my shoes were the brakes for my bike. I mean, my bike had brakes, but I would use my shoes anyway. I would just, you know, you, you just use your feet to stop your bike, right? And so you'd wear, you'd wear the shoes out really fast. And then my jeans, the knees of my jeans, they were the brakes for the rest of my body, pretty much. So, you know, landing, sliding, falling, you land on your knees. And so you would constantly wear out your jeans, wear out your shoes. And so as a single uh, income household, my dad's a school teacher, we didn't, we didn't grow up with a lot of money. And so sometimes what my mom would do is she would get iron-on patches for the holes in my knees. And do you know what happened? It never worked. <laughs> I don't know why we thought that would work. Iron on a patch over a hole and it's just somehow magically going to stay. I think every mom who's ever tried this knows exactly why. Because when you put the new patch on the old material, you throw it into the washing machine and then the patch pulls away. 
you know, the, the, the old fabric pulls away from the new, and then really the whole gets worse. So I wanted to share with you a teaching from Jesus because, you see, Jesus saw a hole in the world. He saw a world that had a need, and it was so much bigger than just putting a patch in place. Jesus looked around him, and he saw real people with real health issues, people who carried burdens and failure and addiction and poverty, people who were oppressed. And he knew that the systems that were currently in place, either by government or religion, didn't work. So Jesus said, no one puts a piece of untrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins and so both are preserved. This morning, I want you to know that Easter is not a patch for your old life. Jesus does not do patch jobs. I think some people encounter hardship in life, and so what they try to do is they just dump more religion on top of their old self, and then they hope that works. But for those of us who've tried that, we know that doesn't work. Have you ever had a plan or a project or something that you were doing, and the thing that was making it worse was you? <laughs> You know, the more you touched it, the more you added to it, the more you tried to fix it or get ahead of it, the worse it got. God wants you to just scrap that. And he wants you to start new. It's the same with wineskins. You know, back in the day, when you, ha when you made fresh wine, you poured it into a fresh wineskin. The wine has to ferment along with the skin. It was a symbiotic process. But see, after you poured the wine in to a wineskin, allowed it to ferment, the two grew together, and then you poured it back out, right, and you drank it, then what happened to the bottle was the skin would dry out and it would get brittle. Well, nobody ever said, well, when we make new wine, we'll just pour it back into these old wineskins. No, that was a great way to ruin your wine because the fermentation process would start again, the alcohol would expand and the skins would break. So when Jesus talks about wineskins, he's actually talking about old religion. The old religion was inflexible. The old religion was brittle. And Jesus knew that he just couldn't pour new teaching into an old system. Jesus said, I'm not here to patch the holes of religion. Your religion is broken, and so adding more religion to it, in other words, new rules or new buildings, that's not going to fix it. You know, sometimes you can fix up an old room with just a fresh coat of paint. Paint wasn't going to work this time. You ever met somebody that was resistant to change? You know, th th they, they liked doing it the old way. Well, of course, there were people that liked the old system. They liked old religion, and they wanted to keep that old system. So if Jesus comes along, and he teaches something new, and he does away with that old system, well, they couldn't stand for that. And that's why we have Easter. Jesus understood the world needed new. That's why he came. I think a lot of people are confused about Easter. They think that Jesus came to start a religion or he started a franchise. That's not true. In fact, the world already had organized religion. Before Jesus came, the world had the temple. And to be fair, it wasn't just the Hebrews, right? All cultures had a temple, had a model, had a plan, had a process. All cultures had sacred spaces and sacred people and sacred texts. But Jesus came into all of that and he said, Behold, I am making all things new. Jesus said, I know you have an old system and you have an old way of doing things, but it's broken 
and I'm here to do something new. You see, Jesus wasn't a fan of temple. He was a fan of people. The temple had a system. It had a message. It was complicated. It was heavy. Jesus had a simple message. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He says, for my yoke, that's his way, his instruction, that's what he brings. He says, is easy, and my burden is light. You know, I think that there's a lot of people who step away from church, they stay away from Christians because it all sounds complicated. It all sounds busy. It's confusing, right? And I think people are turned off by Christianity because it feels a lot like high school. It's it's full of drama. (laughs) And then there's a teacher that's always after you and trying to fail you. I think people are unwilling to learn more about Jesus and his teachings because they're afraid. And it's just going to be more busyness, more rules, and... Their lives are already busy enough as it is. But here's the thing. That's exactly why Jesus came. The reason why there is an Easter Sunday is because with Jesus, it's not about endings. It's about beginnings. The resurrection of Jesus takes place on a Sunday, not a Saturday. So it's a new start. It's a fresh look. It's a whole new week. Jesus came to get rid of the rule book, to simplify the instruction, to focus on the mission and to throw out the old system and to start something new. The message of Jesus is new. Easter is new. The message that life comes from death is new. The message is resurrection. Listen to the Easter story as found in Matthew 28. It says, now after the Sabbath, Toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said." Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. I love this account of the resurrection, because here we have women who are grieving about the past. They are living in darkness. They are wishing that things were different, right? That life was different. And then in the midst of their grief, they meet Jesus. That's Easter. They meet Jesus and he says, now that you've seen me, go and tell others. And these women become Jesus' first witnesses, the first witnesses to the resurrection, the first people to preach the good news, the first people to share the gospel. That's so cool. And it's the story that gets repeated, not just on Easter, but every day. Easter is about resurrection, and Jesus wants you to have this new life. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. What does that mean? It means Jesus wants you to have a new life. I mean, let's be honest. Maybe when you were a kid, you didn't like getting new pairs of pants and you didn't like getting new shoes, but now you do, (laughs) right? Who doesn't love new things? New things mean new smells and new feels and new tastes, new sights, new sounds, new experiences, new adventures. In fact, some of us, we are probably wearing uh, something new right now. Maybe you've got a new tie on or you're wearing new shoes. Of course, there is another reason we like new things. And that's because we get to get rid of our old things, right? Truth is, some things get messed up. And 
It's just better to start over. That's why in January, we have New Year's resolutions. Life gets messed up. We do or say something we want to take back. We want to undo something that was done. Or we want to recapture maybe a missed opportunity. We want to take away a hurt. We want to cover over a disappointment. And because we all make mistakes, we like this idea of starting over. There's a sense of excitement when you can turn your back on the past and look forward to something new, a new opportunity, a new job, a new relationship, a new baby. There's something really exciting about new. Some people love starting the new year. You get to look ahead to fresh starts. Kids love the new school year with new clothes and new school supplies and new friends. But see, this is why Easter is the very best version of new. Paul says anyone who has belonged to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. That means when someone has decided to follow Jesus, Jesus begins this new creation in their life. They aren't reformed. They're not rehabilitated. This isn't a new resolution to just try harder or be better next year. No, that person is recreated. They become a brand new person from the inside and they get a brand new life. Paul goes on to say, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Isn't that amazing? That means we make a decision to give ourselves wholeheartedly to Christ and then he begins a work of recreation in us. We become new witnesses to the empty tomb. Paul says, you are now entrusted with the message of reconciliation. And what is the message? The message is go to the church and start following a bunch of rules. No. (laughs) Paul says the good news is anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Jesus is calling you to him. Right? To Christianity. Jesus is not calling you to church. He is calling you to himself. So why did we get all dressed up and come to church? Well, that's what you do, right? Hey, what's your family going to do for Easter? Well, we're all going to church. But see, for Jesus, he was trying to get away from these sacred places. Jesus wasn't trying to build buildings or perpetuate the model of a holy place. In fact, the early church was a people. They were a group, they were a crowd, they were a community. The early church was a gathering of friends. And this early movement wasn't about going to church, it was about being the church. And you know, it'd be really easy for me to stand up here and to say, you know, if you're not part of a local church this morning, you are missing out. We've got great children's programs, we've got small groups, we're growing, we have potlucks. What, you're not a part of Walden Church? you're missing out. But you know what? That's not true. Your life is busy enough as it is. You're not missing out on anything. No, the truth is, we are missing out. We are missing out. This community is. We miss out when you are not here. Because we miss out on the talents and gifts that only you can bring. Remember, Jesus came to pour new wine into new wineskins, which means Jesus came to establish and encourage a group of people that saw the needs around them, saw the needs of their community, and then became a source of hope and change and love that the world was so desperately needing. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of the other. In this new movement, 
The Bible says that we all belong to each other. We corporately, through togetherness, symbiotically function for the benefit of each other. That's what a body is. It's an individual collection of parts that all come together for the benefit of all. And the truth is, if you're a Christian this morning, if you are a believer in Christ, the Bible says you are a member of that body. Jesus didn't come to make you a better person. He came to make you a new person. And you know what? It really doesn't matter where you are this morning because Easter is a new day and it's a new day for everyone. Easter is for people who wanna trade in their worn out jeans and get a brand new pair. Easter is for people who have come to the end of their glass and they would like a fresh one poured. Easter is for those who have given up and they are ready. They are ready to go all in on something that's brand new. Are you ready for new? I hope so. Maybe things are still going okay for you. I mean, sure, you've made some mistakes, you've messed up a little bit, but you're still living with the hope that, you know, one day you'll be able to start over. Maybe, maybe this new year will be a great time to try something new, turn over a new leaf, maybe drop some bad habits and pick up some good ones. Or maybe things are starting to fall apart. You know, you, you, you tried that starting over thing, you, you, and you've tried it over and over, and maybe you're coming to realize that it's kind of futile to just feel better for a little while, but in the end, you're starting to think that maybe it's never gonna get better. Or maybe you've walked down this road several times. You've gone all through the ups and downs. You've tried it all. You know what it's like to promise yourself a brand new start? You know what it's like to have hopelessness and to give up? But you've never fully given up. And Jesus has kind of always been there in the background as a comfortable friend. But for some reason, you've never actually given that old life away to him. Somehow religion has always felt like a patch. There's good news. Jesus says, I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Are you ready for something new? Are you ready for Easter? It's not hard, it's not complicated, there's no form to fill out, there's no blood test, there's no background check, there's no enrollment. All that work has been done for you. It was all paid for you by the cross. Jesus did all the heavy lifting for you and all you have to do is come in and just claim it. That's why it's called good news. That's why I've been saying it's a new start, it's a new take. In fact, at Walden Church, we believe it's so easy, it's like saying your ABCs. You just admit, admit that you're a sinner. There's no shame in admitting that you are not perfect. If heaven was a reward for perfect people, none of us would go. Romans says all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. And guess what? Once you decide to follow Jesus, you are still not perfect. But right now, you are surrounded by people who, just like Jesus, accept you. Fault and all for who you are. A church is a family. And we are a family made up of people. We are all imperfect. I am imperfect. I am broken. We are all hurting. But together, we are a family that loves Jesus. We believe in Jesus. If you believe that Jesus was a man who walked among us, that he died on the cross, and three days later he came back from the dead. And if you believe, he stands ready to offer you a new life. He is the key. The book of Acts says there is no salvation by anyone else, and there's no other name under heaven by which people can be saved. So if you could admit that you're a sinner, and you can believe that Jesus is God, the Bible says the last thing is you just need to confess it. Confess Jesus as your Redeemer. Romans says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A new life, a new beginning, a new start, a new week. It is just that easy.
And if you're ready for that new life, then I would invite you to bow your heads and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin, from myself, and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I wanna repent and live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with your grace. I wanna to learn to love you and trust you and become everything that you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and thank you for choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. I hope that you have a blessed Easter morning and a blessed Easter week. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in this morning to Walden Community Church. We are always here during the week. Uh, we're here in the offices till three. You can always stop by and visit. We'd love that. We'd love to meet you and shake your hand and uh, tell you about what we're all about. We are here on Sundays every morning. We have two services, one at 9.30. That's our traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing the hymns out of the hymnal. We're going to have communion. We're going to do responsive readings and say the Lord's Prayer. It's going to be exactly like the church that you grew up in. And then at 11 o'clock, we have our contemporary service, and that is also the time we have our full children's program from nursery all the way through high school. We want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.